It's a rarity to be reading from the book of Revelation from the, for the lectionary. <laughs> it's, a, it's a book of strange and mysterious beauty um, and uh, often misunderstood. So this is, an this is an adventure. Our reading is from Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. Write this to the angel of the church in Laodicea. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor a cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. <laughs> After all, you say, I'm rich, and I've grown wealthy, and I don't need a thing. You don't realize that you are miserable, pathetic, poor, blind, and naked. My advice is that you buy gold from me that has been purified by fire, so that you may be rich, and white clothing to wear so that your nakedness won't be shamefully exposed, an ointment to put on your eyes so that you may see. I correct and discipline those whom I love, so be earnest and change your hearts and lives. Look, I'm standing at the door and knocking. If any hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and be with them, and will have dinner with them, and they will have dinner with me. As for those who emerge victorious, I will allow them to sit with me on my throne, just as I emerged victorious and sat down with my Father on his throne. If you can hear, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Thank you, Byron, for reading with boldness, a bold text indeed. It's true we don't often get to hear the words of Revelation read aloud in Sunday morning worship, but we're about to change that trend because for the next eight weeks or so, we are going to be reading aloud the words of Revelation in this place. Amen. Yeah, so please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. God is challenging the church. Stop trying to please everyone. Stop trying to look normal. Let love make you bold and invested, even if you fail. And I will give you the real success and security you long for. The dreams God gives us are certainly strange, but through the ages, they have built us a homeland. They have set us free. God is challenging the church. Okay, so we are deviating from the lectionary a little bit, because if we always followed the lectionary, which is the course of readings that is set with the intention of introducing the church to a whole perspective on the scriptures over the course of three years. If we only ever follow the lectionary, there are some things we would never get to. And one of them is this, this wild dream that comes as the last text in the ordering of the Christian canon by the Protestants. It is a wild text. It is a letter. And what's important about it being a letter is that it is from someone in particular to someone in particular. This is not a poem. 
that's meant to be carved on a wall and reflected on by passers-by. God only knows who they may be. These are not words of principle and instruction, a law that is meant to be uh, to stand and be lived by throughout the ages. No, this is one speaker convicting an audience. And we are not so far away from that audience today. In the time that the book of Revelation was written, there was tremendous political insecurity. After the demise of the emperor Nero, there were three emperors in two years. There was incredible turnover and uncertainty in leadership. What does it mean to be vested with that kind of authority if you can't stay in that position very long at all? The person who is emperor should stand strong and steady and for a generation. What does it mean if that mantle can change wearers after only a few months at a time? It is a time of war. After the war, uh, about a, decade, uh, a, a couple of decades prior to the writing of the letter, many populations have had to move location. There are exiles and refugees, people whose entire communities have been destroyed and have to go elsewhere for safety. We are living in that world today. We recognize that there are wars all over the globe in Ukraine, in Israel and Palestine, in Sudan, in many places that are continuing to displace people and to destroy communities and homelands and force folks to move. Some of these wars are actual declared wars of mutual violence and enmity, and some of them are the kinds of silent wars that occur when there is just not enough to sustain a community any longer in one place. There are refugees, there's turnover in leadership, there is a need for a sense of security and identity that has people drawing boundaries. Yes, in that time, there is political insecurity in our time as well. In that time, there is ecological turnover and tumult. There was a series of drastic earthquakes around the time that this letter was written to the people. It seemed like all of creation was kind of in upheaval along with society. Perhaps you've heard of Mount Vesuvius. Do you remember Mount Vesuvius? What do you remember it for? You remember it for Pompeii. Pompeii is famous and very valuable as an archaeological site because it was preserved an act of destruction that was instantaneous. A vibrant city wiped out all at once. Can you imagine if something like that occurred today in Seattle? <laughs> These folks were dealing with that kind of reality, looking at climate and creation and seeing its power. It has happened perhaps a bit more gradually, but here we are, neighbors to floods that have destroyed communities, torn away households, undermined history and infrastructure. Vesuvius erupted only about 10 years before this letter was written. Keep that in mind as you recall the images of uh, violence and destruction that are present in the book of Revelation. They were not as outlandish then as they may seem now. They lived through it. There was incredible ecological turnover. Then there's incredible change in our climate now. In that time, there was also class division. As a result of some of these climate changes and political changes, they had also recently experienced famine. 
Famine is a terrible thing to go through as a community because it, it plays into all of our fears that live with us in all times of scarcity, that there really is not going to be enough for my family as well as for my friend's family. It does awful things to people and community. Famines create migration. Famines create class divisions and reinforce those structures of who feels the hurt and who does not. At the time when this letter was written, there was generally prosperity. There was generally a sense that the economy was strong and doing well. But the only people who were benefiting from it were the people who were already insulated. For the poor, it was an incredibly anxious time. So too, today, those who have the means and the planning and the generational insight to be invested in the market might feel that this is a time in America where fortunes are growing. But neighbors who are living daily life are experiencing an incredible inconsistency of the presence of services, the ability to access childcare and get to work, the ability for social programs to work consistently and to be fully staffed so that all of us can engage in caring for our families and for ourselves and in doing productive work that is meaningful. Yes, there's general prosperity, but the poor are not experiencing it. Then and now. God is challenging the church then and now. All of these factors of insecurity and upheaval were affecting people called Christians or people who were following Jesus and wrestling what it meant for Jesus to be the Christ at that time because these drawing of boundaries, these sen this sense of um, scarcity, this fear of the end times was requiring those in leadership and also those on the ground to find scapegoats. When they were disappointed or their plans were frustrated or their vision didn't come to fruit, they had to find somebody to blame. They had to define really clearly, who are my people and who are not my people? Who do I owe something to and who do I not owe something to? Who can I blame? Who can I afford to lose? And who can I not afford to lose? And at this time, the people who were following Jesus Christ did not have the benefit of a deep tradition, long social standing, and a robust history. They didn't have those networks of power at all. They didn't have any authority and respect in the common community. And what had happened earlier, shortly after Jesus was risen, where people were creative and exploring and curious and expanding their sense of who they were and who could be a part of the community was contracting. And there was a sense that these people, these what would become understood as Christians, they weren't Gentile enough for the Gentiles to be responsible for them. They also weren't Jewish enough for the Jews to be responsible for them. And this kind of categorizing was leaving them marginalized and persecuted. They were targeted by the emperor who wanted to blame a fire, a devastating fire, that should have been seen as a failure of his response to the people to serve the community and to be organized. He blamed it on the Christians. So you had someone in a role of formal power choosing a scapegoat from among the people because they were unprotected, because they were vulnerable, because they were expendable. 
There was also this sense of uh, kind of, you've heard the phrase litmus test. There was a sense of a litmus test of whether these people who were following Jesus could be considered trustworthy or not, if they could be considered like us or not like us. And so they would routinely be arrested and questioned and forced to show that they would be willing to make an offering to the emperor, a gesture of worship, just so that we know, can we trust you? Or are you a stranger to us? Are you one of ours or not? Christians at this time were marginalized. And this left them with a question of what to do. If we are arrested and called in, if we are targeted for this kind of persecution and pressured in this way, because of our worship of the one God, should we lie? Should we accommodate? Should we say, well, it's a lesser evil. Go along to get along. Should we find a way to blend these principles and cultures and soften the edges that are drawing this unwanted attention to us? These are questions that are still extremely active today in any society where any religion, ethnicity, skin color, language, is marginalized. These questions are still live. And those of us who have been part of the church for several decades know that these questions are starting to crop up in our own lives too. Certainly in conversations about leadership and direction for the future of the church, we're tempted to draw on all of these strategies that come from business or other kind of organizational management to look for possibilities within the culture to find some sort of stability and security to benefit from things that are designed to benefit not really people who follow Jesus, but can help protect us from some of the insecurity and uncertainty of the future. I got to have a conversation, I was so privileged to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation a few years ago with Elaine Heath, who is a scholar and an innovator in the area of intentional community and new monasticism. And we were speaking about this a little bit and she said, ah yes, Christianity is going back to the margins which is good news because that's where the Holy Spirit has been this whole time. But what are we to do? Should we mitigate, accommodate, assimilate? How do we belong? In comes this text. Let love make you bold and invested. Be cold or hot. If you are lukewarm, God is getting ready to spew you out. I love that image. As troubling and convicting as it is. There's another story that illustrates this, I believe, in the gospel. From the gospel according to Luke. Do you remember Zacchaeus? What do we remember Zacchaeus for? He's a wee little man. A wee little man was he. This is the story according to the message. Uh, paraphrase. Then Jesus entered and walked through Jericho. There was a man there, his name Zacchaeus, the head tax man and quite rich. He wanted desperately to see Jesus, but the crowd was in his way. He was a short man and couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran on ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree so that he could see Jesus when he came by. When Jesus got to the tree, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry down. Today is my day to be a guest in your house. Today is my day to be a guest in your house. Zacchaeus scrambled out of the tree, hardly believing his good luck, delighted to take Jesus home with him. Everyone who saw the incident was indignant and grumped, what business does he have getting cozy with this crook? Zacchaeus just stood there a little stunned. 
He stammered apologetically, Master, I give away half my income to the poor, and if I'm caught cheating, I pay four times the damages. Jesus said, Today is salvation day in this home. Here he is, Zacchaeus, son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to find and restore the lost. Jesus drags Zacchaeus into the center of attention, this small man who goes along to get along. Tax collectors in that time were people who worked for the oppressive government in their social networks and community and skimmed off the top. Right? Zacchaeus says, in the presence of Jesus, if I've wronged someone, I'm going to repay them four times. I'm guessing he said that because everybody was looking at him. And he was standing next to his hero. May we all be so challenged to find out who we may be because everyone is looking at us and we are standing next to our hero. God is saying, let love make you bold and invested. Let love make you bold and invested. This text from Revelation says, be either cold or hot. Look, it's better to make mistakes than never to launch a dream at all. The images that come from Revelation infused with dream logic and passion and the reality of the context of then and now, a time of turmoil and disruption, the images are inspired. They come from, they are drawn out of the Old Testament. This is on purpose. It is to show us we have been here before. We have been here before. Those of us who are sitting in this space may not be used to, I assure you, are definitely not used to being marginalized in this way. But as a people with a history far longer than any one of our lives, we have been here before. God saw us through then and will see us through again. So let love make us bold and invested because the dreams God gives us are of strange, yes, strange abundance. The invitation of Revelation comes to us in such intense language because it is seeking to move us from resignation or cynicism to boldness. It is calling us to a clarity of vision. It is fearsome because it is seeking to be as big as God. In our encounter with God, in our relationship with God, God has reached out to us in our deepest depths and drawn us up. God has sought us and found us, come for us when we are lost, and located us within God's love and God's loving community. Our dreams are from God, and they ought to be. It is right that they be as big as God. They ought to be fearsome because they are as big as God. We do not move on any of this alone. Part of the abundance in, abundant inheritance that we have been given is this, our community, which is not just in the pews this morning. It is also the community of students at Second Start who will, because of this program, I assure you, change the city and change the world, right? It is also the connection that we witness when we come together around the district superintendent and we see the ways that we are interwoven and our future is interwoven with the face of people who are ministering today all over the world. Like the pastor, the United Methodist pastor who is serving a reconciling church in Kenya, a country where you can be executed for being gay. We are connected in a community of boldness. It comes from God. 
And when we answer the door to Christ's knock, the promise is just as it was with Zacchaeus. Today is my day to dine with you in your house. May it indeed be so. Amen.